so yeah, so for the morning session, we have a group of fantastic speakers and kelp experts to introduce us to the world of kelp and its significance both in the UK and in the global context. Firstly, we will have two pre-recorded talks, one from the UK's leading seaweed expert based at the Natural History Museum, Professor Juliet Brody, followed by Dr. Kane Layton, who's part of a team working on a pioneering kelp restoration project in Tasmania. And following these pre-recorded um, presentations, we will hear from Professor Pippa Moore and Dr. Dan Smell in person about their hugely important research into UK kelp habitat. Hello, everyone. I want to thank Sally Ashby for inviting me to speak at this conference. I'm going to give you a brief overview of the seaweeds and to try to give you a taste of why I find them so inspiring. But I also want to try and put that into the context of kelp. And what has always fascinated me about seaweeds is their diversity and wealth of shapes and colours. But first, what are seaweeds and why are they so important? Well, the seaweeds, they are the red and the green and the brown macroalgae, but the reds and greens belong in a completely different group to the brown algae. And in the lower part of this slide, I've put a very simple eukaryotic tree of life, and the reds and greens are in the archaeoplastida along with the land plants. The reds and greens are ancient, at over 1.6 billion years old, so they've had all that time to evolve and to adapt and to occupy many different niches. The browns are much more recent and are in a completely different major eukaryotic group, the stramina piles, along with the single-celled diatoms and some other groups. They evolved just after the start of the dinosaurs at about 200 million years ago, but have outlasted them. The kelps, they came around about 20 million years ago, and the giant kelp is one of the largest eukaryotic organisms on the planet and at about 60 metres height. And that's the height of the Natural History Museum, for those of you that are familiar with that. All the algae have chlorophyll A, as do the land plants, but the red algae have accessory pigments, phycobilins, and the browns have a unique pigment in biology, the carotenoid called fucosanthin and that's an antioxidant. The other major importance of the seaweeds and pertinent to this conference is that they are habitat forming. And you can see here on the right hand side, the kelp forests and the fucoid habitats. And at the bottom of the diagram, I've put the calcified seaweeds, which form a variety of different habitats, including coralline turfs and here the, the crusts and the mole beds. And these corallines can give cues to plankton to settle and then they will metamorphose and grow into a range of different organisms, some of which are important for the shellfish industry. Just to think for a moment about how many seaweeds are there on the planet, well we've described about 12,000 so far and there may be about 24,000 in total. In Britain, we have about 650, which is a hotspot of seaweed diversity, and we're adding to that list all the time. But I want to just go back to consider these habitats in a bit more detail, and I'm going to start here by looking at these calcified seaweeds. They can form extensive reefs, and the closer you look, the more you can see. And these are really like a wonderful miniature world with many creatures living in them and the diversity can be as high or higher than in coral reefs. And then if we have a look at the kelp forests, these are remarkable. And when you are listening to this talk, I hope I'll be in South Georgia where this picture was taken. And Darwin in 1834, he recognised just how important these giant aquatic forests were. And he wrote... Yet, if any country a forest was destroyed, I do not believe nearly so many species of animals would perish as here from the destruction of the kelp. And kelp forests are one of the most productive ecosystems on the planet, and their nurseries for fish, and they protect our coastlines, they provide us with ecosystem services, 
And they also contain alginates, which are a very, very valuable product. I also thought I'd like to show you here in the Falkland Islands, these very low lying islands, how the kelp forests form a girdle around the islands, protecting them. And they form a lagoon between the forest and the land. And in the, those lagoons, you can see a diversity of seabirds and you can see also um, mammals which spend time there feeding and just hanging out. I also want to talk to you about another phenomenon in the seaweeds, and this is called structural colour. This is what we see on the shore as iridescence, these wonderful colours of turquoise and pinks and greens. And on the left is Ericaria selaginoides, which you may be more familiar with as Cystosara tamariscifolia, giving out this wonderful turquoise hue. And in the middle is a red seaweed, Chondria carolescens. And this gives off turquoise, and then later on in the year gives off a more purple hue. And the little light bulbs you can see, these are the, the sister carps, which are the reproductive bodies in the females. And on the right hand side is another species of Chondria. And at the bottom here, this is Chondria scintillans, is a reflectant spectrum image. And you can see these wonderful shapes, these ovals, lots of different colours. And if you look, look carefully, you'll see lots of little dots. And these are the iridescent bodies that are reflecting the light out. And I just want to show you a little bit more about this. This is work that we're doing with our colleagues in Cambridge as part of a big EU project called BEEP. And on the left is Chondria carolescens. Here you can see these bodies are giving out greens and blues. In the middle is Chondria scintillans, related and yet showing a very different pattern of reflectance with these ovals in rainbow colours. And on the right is a phenomenon that we've only really just discovered recently. I had a hunch about this and now we've shown that the Cladophorales, which includes the very common Cladophora rupestris, has structural colour. And you can see here it gives off these sort of range of almost like tartan colours. And you can probably just see that there are, are fibres running through the picture there. These are microfibrils and these are producing the colour. And these structures are similar, similar to those that we find in the land plants that are coloured. But I want to return to the kelps, and, and you might be thinking, why am I telling you about structural colour? They're all part of these ecosystems, they're all part of our seaweeds, and there's so much we don't know. We don't know, for example, in the structural colour, why they have this. Is this protection against ultraviolet light? We also think there may be scope for developing new materials. There's so much to learn. But in the kelp forests, we know that the kelps are in trouble. We know that in the world, it's been estimated that approximately 38% have been lost or degraded. This is a frightening statistic. And here in England, we know that in the southwest, our Laminaria hyperborea is declining. It's a very, very rich species in terms of the diversity it supports. It's being replaced by Laminaria ocreluca that's filling the gaps. This is not nearly so diverse in the species it supports. We know that sea temperature is changing the distribution of the brown algae and that they're moving north here in the northern hemisphere and we're losing them at their southern edges. Ocean acidification is another phenomenon that is happening as a result of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere and this is affecting the structural integrity of our calcified habitats. And at the same time, we have an increase in the arrival of the non-natives. In Britain, for example, in the last six years, 5% of the flora has gone to 6% of the flora, which are non-natives. This is a very quick rise in a very short space of time. Things are happening, things are changing, and they're changing fast. But here in Britain, we're in perhaps a better place than many other parts of the world because we have a checklist 
Many parts of the world do not have a checklist or only something very rudimentary, but we have one for over 70 years. And it does mean we've been able to record and map the seaweeds. We have guides. We can monitor the impact of environmental change. We have um, evidence that we can use to inform policy. We also have recently just done a red list assessment and we have the big seaweed search, a citizen science project. So to conclude, I consider that we're living in one of the most challenging times for science, but also one of the most exciting times to be a scientist, especially in seaweeds. And seaweeds are remarkable organisms and there's so much still to discover about them. Kelp forests are vital for the functioning of shallow water ecosystems and it is imperative that we act to ensure the survival of these remarkable organisms. Hi everyone, my name's Kane and I'm a marine ecologist from the University of Tasmania in Australia. And I'm just gonna briefly chat today about some of the work we're doing down here and hope to share some of those lessons um, and some of our failures and our successes. So I'm just going to start off kind of a little bit reversed and acknowledge um, that, you know, it's certainly not just me here at IMAS and at UTAS who are working on this. Um, there's several uh, core people involved in this. Um, we've got partners across the state, across Australia and, you know, collaborators internationally as well. We're really all working together to help kind of, um, you know, learn a lot of these lessons and see how we can overcome some of these really big challenges at the moment. And I'd also like to take the opportunity to acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands and waters on which this research was conducted and which I'm based and pay our respects to elders past and present. So Australia and Tasmania has some really spectacular kelp forests. Um, in Tasmania specifically, we've got giant kelp forests and Tassie's really the epicentre for this species in Australia, although it does occur to a lesser extent on the mainland. And, you know, these kelp forests really are underwater forests, almost more like underwater jungles. You know, they can grow 30, 40 metres tall, as tall as a six-storey building, incredibly dense in places, um, so dense you can't swim through them. Um, you know, really, again, dense, thick canopy. The light is often a lot darker underneath that canopy. The swell can be lessened. It's really like kind of walking in a forest on land, you know, it changes the environment. And it's really the same with giant kelp, these amazing underwater forests. Unfortunately, in Tasmania, our giant kelp forests are disappearing. And over the past several decades, since about the 1940s, we've recorded about 95% reductions in giant kelp forest canopy cover. And I stress canopy cover there because these measurements are taken from uh, initially from aerial surveys, from light aircraft, and more recently satellite imagery. So, I mean, we have a good picture of what's happening at the forest level, at the population level from the surface, but really we don't have as good an understanding as what's happening beneath the waves. And that's really a pretty, um, common theme in kelp forests across the globe, really. They're massively understudied despite their value, but especially in places like Southern Australia and Tasmania, you know, our marine environments are really this kind of big black box. Uh, with the giant kelp specifically, those reductions, those 95% reductions are due to changing oceanography and specifically climate change, climate change, sorry, and increased temperature and decreased coastal nutrients due to increasing influence of the East Australian current in Eastern Tasmania. You might know the East Australian current or the EAC from Finding Nemo. It's a warm, nutrient-poor current. It's getting stronger with climate change and bringing that warm, nutrient-poor water into Tasmania and displacing the water here that traditionally was more characteristic of the Southern Ocean, cooler, more nutrient-rich. And that cool, those cool, nutrient-rich conditions are really what giant kelp love. That extension of the EAC is actually making Southeast Australia including Eastern Tasmania, a global ocean warming hotspot. And we're warming about four times faster than the global average. The losses of giant kelp forests in Tasmania are not only very significant at the local scale, but also federally. And those losses are um, recognised at the federal, at the national level. And our giant kelp forests are actually the first listed marine community um, to be federally listed as threatened um, or endangered. So again, those losses are very significant. So is there help for our giant kelp? You know, habitat restoration is getting a lot of um, press at the moment, I guess. And 
you know, so one of the things we're looking at is can we use habitat restoration as a management tool? Can we re- halt those declines and potentially even reverse some of them? Can we restore some of these habitats? Well, a really fundamental kind of um, first point for habitat restoration is can we overcome or address the driver of decline? So in this specific instance, that's climate change, that's ocean warming, and there are things, unfortunately, that we can't overcome. So potentially it doesn't make much sense to go out and restore these environments if we can't solve the reason they're declining in the first place, right? So we're taking a little bit of a reverse approach to it and we're seeing instead of changing the environment back to the way it was, can we help the remaining kelp, that remaining kind of 5%, can we help them... Uh, become more adapted to the modern conditions, those warm, nutrient poor conditions that we've created. So we've gone out to that remaining 5%, um, which are still scattered up and down the coast. I mean, you would expect that the populations would be restricted right into our southern areas, those cooler waters, but they're still scattered individuals, small patches up and down our coastline. Um, And those individuals seem physiologically healthy. They have nice colour. They're still reproductive. They just don't form those big forests in the north anymore that they used to. Um, So we went to these remnant locations and we collected spores from them. It's non-destructive. Giant kelp have a specialised leaf at the base of the individual. We just take a couple of them, take them back to the lab, release the spores. Um, And then we can maintain those kelp cultures in the lab here. We actually keep them under red light and that basically puts them in suspended animation um, or hibernation, which is nice. It means we've almost got like a, a kombucha or a sourdough culture that we can keep going back to and using without having to go out and um, sample each time. It also means we've got traceability and we can test and experiment on those individual genotypes or strains or whatever you want to call them. Um, and if we identify any that are potentially more warm water tolerant, uh, we might be able to use them for our restoration efforts. Um, in addition to those primary cultures, so the ones under red light, we've also established a long-term seed bank collection. And that's both as a form of genetic conservation, but also as a backup. If we have a power failure, if one of the students leaves the door open for the cool room and we lose those primary cultures, we've got a backup. And that's really important because again, those losses we've had are really significant in Tassie. So, you know, we want to preserve whatever genetic um, material and genetic kind of history and information is left. So we were really hunting for these thermally tolerant individuals amongst the remnant kelp. Are there remnant giant kelp that are naturally more tolerant of warm water? The same way some humans are naturally taller than others, you know, are some giant kelp naturally tall, uh, naturally more tolerant than others? So we tested um, using those kelp cultures, we tested the baby kelp when they're only about a millimetre or two in size um, at a range of temperatures. And obviously those individuals that survived at the warmer temperatures, um, you know, that suggests that they are slightly more warm water tolerant. So out of the 50 strains we collected across those six sites, we found that about 15% of them actually exhibited increased tolerance to warm water conditions. And it wasn't just a degree or two, it was actually, you know, three, four, five degrees above the population average, even up to 24 degrees Celsius. And that was an experimental treatment, an experimental temperature that we put in basically just as an endpoint. We didn't expect any to survive at that. It would just be a nice endpoint for us to say, okay, none survived there. Let's look at the 16 and the 20 degree ones. But surprisingly, some of them survived even up at 24 degrees. Really interestingly was that site and region Um, The site and region where we collected these uh, spores from wasn't related to their tolerance to warm water. So even those individuals in the north, which is the warmest part of the state for us, um, those individuals were no more tolerant of warm water than some of the individuals from the south. And, you know, vice versa, some of those individuals from the cool south were actually the most tolerant. So really, it just seems to be this random smattering amongst the population, which is really interesting from a kind of genetic and ecological point of view. And also really interesting from a restoration point of view that you can't just assume that, well, that's growing in a warm environment that must be more warm water tolerant. So really we wanted to investigate, could we use these warm water tolerant, these super kelp as the basis for restoration trials? And we're actually um, doing those trials at the moment. So about a year ago, we outplanted, um, we went back to the cultures and we cultivated a whole bunch of those individual genotypes that were the best performing under those laboratory conditions, under those warm water conditions. Uh, We grew them up and we actually planted them out. 
that was a year ago. And when we planted them out, that second photo there, we actually seed these small plastic dishes. We've used ceramic dishes before as well. And we bolt them into the uh, seafloor at about 12 meters depth. And on that plate, there's probably thousands of, you know, just millimeter small baby giant kelp, baby super kelp. Um, we did this at three trial locations in about 100 square meters. So, you know, relatively large areas, but we're still very much in that um, very early kind of foundational phase. And what we were really looking is, could we establish self-supporting little patches of giant kelp, but also self-expanding, potentially these seed patches that we can use to seed the broader area where giant kelp has been lost. So after 12 months, and we actually had a slightly warmer than average summer, we had a La Nina summer here um, at the start of the year for us. But the most recent estimates, so after 12 months, the first site we had no survivors, unfortunately. We're not exactly sure, but that site did have a lot of sedimentation and right from the get-go, we always knew that would be the most challenging site. But at the following two sites, after uh, 12 months, we've got about 40 to 45 survivors across those at each of those sites. Average size about two to three meters, which is really incredible considering they went out at you know a millimeter. But the maximum size of some of those individuals are, um, is in excess of five meters at one side and in excess of 11 meters at one side, which is really interesting. It starts to show again that potential that you can have by you know selective breeding and identifying those individuals that uh, might perform best under specific conditions. So to have a 12 meter tall kelp that's only a year old is really encouraging. And also really encouraging for us was at the end of last summer, uh, when those juveniles were still quite small, only about uh, five to 10 centimeters in size, they looked really healthy. They had really good pigmentation, despite the fact that the local kind of the scattered giant kelp that was still around looked in really poor shape. So that's a nice encouraging sign for us that, you know, potentially that thermal tolerance we found in the lab will actually translate to the field. And these are just some photos that I took just two weeks ago when we were out in the field doing our most recent surveys. Um, so you can see little areas of these are starting to look like little areas of giant kelp forest. And this is really exciting. Also really exciting for us is that these giant kelp, some of the larger individuals are now starting to become reproductive. And that photo in the bottom right there is one of those specialized spore bearing blades at the bottom of the plant. Um, and the discolored area is actually the spores. So that's really exciting for us because we get to transition to the next stage of the project where we can see if the kelp that we planted will actually start to produce their own babies and help to create this patch that's self-supporting and also self-expanding. And that's really important because restoration, it's never gonna work for me and my colleagues to go out and keep planting these individual plates on the sea floor. We need to kickstart a natural cycle and get these patches kind of expanding on their own accord. So I'm just going to very briefly wrap up with some kind of bigger picture um, points, I guess, about knowledge sharing and failures. And really, kelp restoration is very much still in its infancy. And I think that's something important to acknowledge and that even where we have had successes, you know, we've had a lot of failures as well. And those successes have to be taken um, in context, right? So, and there really are no silver bullets or no one best approach or method for how to plant kelp or, or how to restore areas. And it's really about, in my opinion, adding to this restoration toolbox, right? For different methods, different sites, different conditions, different kelp species. Um, you really have to understand what's driving the decline of your kelp in the first place. Um, and again, those different methods what was successful in one place might not be successful in another place. It's like trying to build a house with only one tool or to fix a car with only one tool. It doesn't make sense. And it's the same for fixing kelp forests. We need to look at all of the tools in our toolbox and apply them for where they're most um, ideal. And again, considering that we're still very much in the infancy, we really advocate for a precautionary approach and a very science-based approach. And I guess that precautionary principle is very pertinent where potential restoration actions might impact existing kelp forests. And um, that's something we're very aware of here with the work with our giant kelp and making sure that our plantings aren't impacting the few remaining giant kelp forests that are left. And it's really important to share successes, but also failures, right? In terms of this kind of kelp forest restoration community globally, learning together because we really need to fail together in order to succeed together and create this um, this collective kind of momentum for action and, and knowledge and um, knowledge sharing. 
and that was it. Nice and short and sweet. Again, I mean, it's a real, it's a big team here with lots of collaborators domestically and internationally. There's a whole bunch of work still ongoing, looking at the genetics, looking at the physiology of these individuals, um, and we're really just at the very early stages. You know, I wouldn't even say we're walking before we're running. I'd say we're crawling before we're walking now, but there's some exciting signs in terms of those uh, reproductive individuals and patch expansion. So the next kind of six to 12 months and this next summer will be really exciting and really challenging to see if our super kelp can survive those tough summer conditions. Okay, thank you. Thanks to Sally and the organisers for inviting us to talk today. It's great to be an actual uh, real life in person meeting. Um, Chris and I are going to give a joint talk because we've been working together on a project for nearly eight years now, actually, to um, try and understand the structure, uh, diversity and productivity of kelp forests in the UK. So I'm going to give a sort of broad overview of the importance of kelp in the UK context, and then Pip's going to come halfway through and sort of gain some nuts and bolts of some of the work we've been doing. So uh, Juliet touched on this, but just I know we're a sort of broad audience today, so I thought I'd start by just explaining what actually is kelp, and it's not actually straightforward. So taxonomically speaking, kelp's a feeding species that belongs to the order land aerials. There's about 110-ish species around the world of true kelps, um, but ecologists like us tend to use a broader definition that includes other um, large brown canopy-forming seaweeds that may belong to other taxonomy groups. Uh, they have a biphasic life cycle, so they have a microscopic, microscopic leaf-spike stage, which forms this like fuzzy brown matrix on the leaf, and then this larger macroscopic um, sporophyte, which is this plant-like structure. And typically they have um, a holdfast, which is a bit like a root that attaches the plant to the leaf, a stipe, which is akin to a, a stem in a terrestrial plant, and then this um, blade or lamina, which is the large area of photosynthesis. So I guess most of us are kind of used to seeing um, dead sporophytes or barely alive sporophytes washed up on the beach after a storm. So why do we spend um, a large proportion of our life thinking about kelp? Well, um, first of all, they're geographically very widespread. So kelps are predicted to inhabit around a quarter of the world's coastline. They're particularly abundant uh, in sort of um, Arctic areas, temperate regions. But you do get some populations in warmer waters and also on, on deeper reefs. Uh, they're hugely productive, so some kelp species are amongst the fastest growing uh, primary producers on Earth, and that um, provides fuel for inshore food webs. So some organic matter uh, is consumed directly by herbivores, such as the blue rayed limpet, and also sea urchins are very common consumers. But actually, the vast majority, around 80% of production, uh, is consumed through the detrital food web by microbes and invertebrate detritivores. So most of, the, most of it's not consumed actually in sea. Uh, kelp's a true foundation species, so they alter the environment and provide biogenic habitat for a wide array uh, of associated plants and animals. And in doing so, they elevate local biodiversity, similar to how trees do on land. Um, and they provide dark habitat through those different microstructures of the plant. These are just pictures of kelp holdfast from different species around the world. I just wanted to show high variability between different species. But they provide really high quality habitat. This interstitial spaces between the hatchery of the, the holdfast is really excellent for colonization for a wide range of organisms. And if you take giant kelp Maxtitis in California, for example, that holdfast may be up to two meters in diameter, so that's a high volume um, of, ha of habitat. And compare that with, say, Saccharida uh, polycides or furbello, which we have in the UK. It's a much smaller plant, but has this distinctive bulbous um, shape, which provides a lot of internal living space for calves and even fish um, to have some overwintering. Uh, the, the, the site also offers a large area for colonization. This is Laminaria hyperborea, which is our kind of assemblage dominant around the UK. Uh, and this is colonized by a high abundance of both red algae here and also encrusting um, organ animals like sponges and biogerans. And in turn, that offers secondary habitat, increases complexity and habitat area for colonization um, by lots of associated organisms. And when you have lots of kelp plants together, you have a stand or a forest. Um, I'd just like to thank Richard Dutchness up in Shetland, who's um, given us permission to use some of his amazing photos in this talk. Uh, and you can see that where you have um, lots of plants together, you have this high quality kelp forest. Um, they can be extremely extensive. That's just a view um, over the canopy at one of the Scottish sites. 
There's some work by my PhD student um, a couple of years ago showed that a single kelp hold fast in the UK may support up to more than 50 different species for this in a single hold fast. A work from Norway showed that one plant can support more than 80,000 um, individual animals. And so we're talking mostly uh, brittle stars, um, crabs, anthropods, gastropods, these kind of invertebrates which are really important in the food web, they're really important fish food. Uh, yeah, and so just in terms of, um, oh, sorry, yeah, so, as, yeah, so because of, because of this habitat provision, kelp forests are obviously critical foraging and nursery habitat for fish, shellfish, mammals, and birds. And again, some nice pictures to demonstrate that. These are a high abundance of um, juvenile, juvenile fish using kelp for nursery. And then obviously you get your cute and cuddly big animals that come in to forage. Um, so you can see that here. Uh, and they offer other... So they offer other heat ecosystem services, um, such as biogenic coastal defense by dumping wave action, uh, nutrient cycling, and potentially as, as donors within blue carbon ecosystem services, which we'll get on to. Um, when Pip and I sort of started working on UK kelp forests almost eight years ago, there really wasn't much interest in the academic community and also in the wider public. Um, but I think that's really changed in the last few years. It's been quite noticeable, and that's in no small part to the Help Our Kelp um, campaign here in Sussex. But uh, there have been lots of sort of kelpy based news stories from around the UK. For example, in Scotland, there were proposals to, to wild harvest large areas of kelp, um, which faced really fierce public backlash, which made the news. And there are several kelp farms and seaweed farms popping up around the coast. And more generally, there's an interest in these ecosystems in terms of uh, nature-based solutions and, 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 and mitigating against climate change. So it feels that these um, really important habitats are starting to get the recognition and the attention that they warrant. Okay, so our research really, the aim of it is to understand how um, these contemporary stresses, how these environmental changes, things like uh, increased sea temperature, changes in storminess, processes acting across the land sea interface and the spread of invasive species, how those stresses affect the, the structure and biodiversity of these habitats, which in turn how that alters, how that may alter the way they function and the ecosystem services that they provide. So that's kind of the overarching goal of our research program. And if we just take one of those stresses, this is um, ocean warming, which is perhaps the most pervasive stressor to marine ecosystems globally. This background map just shows um, the rate of warming in coastal waters around the world. Everywhere, everywhere that's red has warmed um, in recent decades, so most of the globe. And we know that kelp uh, are very sensitive to changes in temperature. And so in response to these warming trends, we've seen lots of different responses around the world, uh, including local extinction of bull kelp in New Zealand following marine heat waves. Uh, in the UK, we've seen an increase in the abundance of a, a more warm adapted species. And then several areas around the world have seen local declines in abundance or um, uh, range contractions in response to these uh, increase in warming, temp warming trends. Okay, so just the UK context, and then Pip will take over in a sec, but um, in UK and Ireland, kelp are found along around 12,000 kilometers of coastline. They're distributed from the low intertidal, so maybe a meter above chart datum, to depths of uh, around 40 meters or even more in exceptionally clear waters. Uh, there have been a few estimates um, of uh, aerial extent in the UK and Ireland. Chris Justin, who's here, has done some work on this. And the, 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 total, the, the estimates range from around 9,000 to 19,000 square kilometers. Um, so there's still some uncertainty, but they, they basically occupy a large area of our coastline, subtidal waters. And the total standing stock may be around 20 million tons of fresh wave. And just to put those numbers into some context, if we take the upper uh, estimate, for example, um, that area is around 30 times that of salt marshes in the UK, 200 times that of seagrass meadows. And about the same area of broadly forest on land, uh, which is about the same area as Wales, which a lot of things are. And um, in terms of the wet weight, the total standing stock is around four times the annual harvest of potatoes. So I, the point is, is that they're uh, extremely widespread and offer um, very vast habitat for, for, for within the ecosystem. I'm just going to hand over to Pip. Dan will be very, very pleased that you laughed at his joke. <laughs> um, so, um, Dan's given you a really nice introduction with some really nice photos where I dive into the kelp forest and some fun facts to go along with it. 
So um, my job now is to sort of perhaps um, focus in a little bit more on the sort of drivers, the structure of kelp forests in the UK, and then also look at some of the, um, the, the roles that they can play in terms of their ecosystem services. So um, we know both globally and in the UK that the distribution of kelp is driven by a range of environmental and biological factors. So Dan's already um, mentioned that temperature is a key driver of the distribution of kelp. Um, we also know that wave exposure is really important. So some kelp kelps like Laminaria hyperborea are found on very wave exposed coastlines. And then other species of kelp like Saccharina latissima is more restricted to, to more wave sheltered or tidal conditions. Um, they're photosynthetic, photosynthetic organisms, so um, you, they, they need light to gain energy, and therefore they're very much restricted in terms of their depth um, in the water column by light um, um, and, and turbidity. So what we might find around sort of more turbid coastlines, or say along the North Sea, is they're restricted to shallower depths, and where you go out to say the, the far west of Scotland and St Kilda, they can be found down to 48 metres. Around much of the UK, they're sort of around 20 metres. That's where we've um, found along the, the west coast um, of the United Kingdom and the far northeast of England. They're restricted to, to rocky or bouldery substrate um, because they need to use their hat through their hold fast to attach to these rocky substrates. And they're also influenced um, by um, the amount of nutrients in the system. Um, Payne Layton uh, uh, talked about that with, in terms of the giant kelp in Tasmania. Um, also tidal flow um, and grazing and competition. So there's a lot of competition for light, for instance. Collectively, we can actually use these different drivers. We can measure these drivers in, in the field, either directly or via remote sensing. And then we can provide predictive habitat maps to sort of estimate where we would expect kelp forests and the different species to exist based on their um, requirements. So in the UK, um, we have um, seven different um, species of kelp. Um, one of these, as Dan talked about, is, is not a true kelp, it's not a laminarial, it's this one here, Saccharides polystides, um, belongs to a different group. Um, so in, in, in reality, we've got six laminarials um, and, and, and a, a non-true kelp. Um, we also have this um, invasive species, Ungaria pinotipita, that's expanding its range around the United Kingdom. Um, and what we can see, these maps here are for the different species. So if we look at Laminaria ocreluca here, you can see the map here. It's very much restricted to the south coast um, of the United Kingdom. It reaches its um, northern range limit in Britain um, on Lundy Island um, and um, on the Isle of Wight along the Eastern Channel. And we can see species like um, Laminaria hyperborea is dis dis distributed that much of the United Kingdom. As Kane talked um, earlier, and, and Dan showed with his distribution map, is kelp are considered generally cold water species, and some are more tolerant of warmer water conditions than others. So we look at these species here, they're all very much considered cold water species, and as the climate warms, they're likely to do less well. These species here are considered um, warm water species. So Laminaria ocreluca, for instance, reaches its southern range limit in Morocco, so experiences much warmer temperatures than we currently experience in the United Kingdom. And as we all know, um, one of the most pervasive stresses in the marine environment is, is, is global warming. And so what we're starting to see is changes in the structure of our kelp forests. Um, so we're seeing increases in the abundance of Laminaria ocreluca around the southwest, for instance. Um, and Dan's already said, is, um, Dan and I met in Western Australia in a, in a postdoc, and when we came back to the UK, we decided we'd like to do some research together. And we just sort of felt that while there was lots and lots of work done on kelp forests around the globe, the UK, which had led kelp forest research in the sort of 40s and 50s, had really become neglected, in part because of um, health and safety, meaning diving for work had become more difficult. Um, and we decided that we wanted to change that, um, so we set up a project um, that meant we got to travel around the west coast of the United Kingdom um, uh, two or three times a, a, a year um, and enjoying the hospitality of these different regions. Um, one of the other cool things is that, at, oh, is that the United Kingdom um, has a, a, a temperature gradient. So around the south and west coast of the United Kingdom, it's about two and a half degrees warmer 
than the north coast of the United Kingdom. And so this is sometimes called a space for time gradient. So if we're interested in how um, uh, communities, kelp communities might change with climate change, is that this is two and a half degrees warmer than here. So if the, the, the structure or, or the diversity of organisms in the southwest are different to the north, we could predict that this is going to be what the north will be like by 2100. We think um, to what the NDC um, uh, targets that were uh, signed on Saturday, on Saturday in COP26 is that we're predicting a warming of 2.4 degrees Celsius at present. So far, rather fortuitously, we've shown a really good gradient. Um, and so one of the things that we were particularly interested in is how kelp forests are structured. So um, we did a lot of swimming around kelp forests, um, counting um, individual kelp, looking at St. Cover Dan and I are very good at counting things, not very good at very many other things. Um, but what we can look here is that these are the different kelp species. This is the um, dominant kelp species, Laminaria hyperborea, on exposed coastlines. And you can see that we can find that all across these sites. And there's not really much difference in the, the abundance across these sites. But what we can also see is that there are diff some different structuring. So if you look here, these red sites and orange sites, this, the red is um, uh, southwest England, the orange is Wales, the light blue is Oban, and the dark blue is Orkney, is that you can see that um, laminary ochreluca, this warm water kelp, is only found um, at our southern sites. And actually, interestingly, is more restricted to a more sheltered sites. So if we lose Laminaria hyperborea exposed sites, it's not necessarily going to be replaced by another species of kelp because this one is less toler tolerant of wave exposure. We can also see that other species like um, Alaria esculenta is very much restricted to northern locations. It is distributed further down to the south, but we didn't find any in our quadrats and it's very, very rare in these locations because it's such a cold water species. One of the things about kelp for us, and one of the things that is gaining increasing um, interest, is that kelp is incredibly good at taking carbon dioxide out of the ocean and converting that to, to, to biomass. So um, it, that, when people talk about kelp having really high pri primary productivity, um, what they're saying is that they're very good at turning that carbon from the CO2 into carbon in tissue growth. And what we wanted to do um, as part of this work is a, look at the primary productivity within the UK kelp forest, but also to understand what happened to that kelp, um, that kelp growth um, through time. So, oops, and, and also how it differed in different locations. So this is Dan here doing some transects, looking at density, and we also tagged over a thousand kelp to look at dislodgement rates. They are in very wave exposed environments, so what proportion of kelp is lost in storm events? We also tagged over 400 um, plants to look at growth. So some of you might be able to see these two holes there. Um, what you can do is kelp has a, like a conveyor belt growth. So you can just hole punch it. And these holes, that where they break from is called the meristem just there. These hole punches move away from that meristem and then you can measure how much they grow. You can do some um, work to look at how much biomass in terms of, of what that is. Um, we also collected biomass values. That's when Dan was very young, back in 2014. Looks like a little boy in that photo. Um, and we also looked at the face of this kelp. So kelp loses um, material by three means. Dislodgement, hence why we tag them. Um, they also continually erode from the tips of their fronds. Um, so they have that conveyor belt, the, the younger tissue is at the bottom, at the end of that tissue is older tissue that just gets eroded away by natural processes. Laminaria um, hyperborea is also quite interesting. It has um, fixed growth rates, so it grows over um, uh, the sort of winter months. Um, it, it stores um, uh, uh, carbohydrates during the summer when there's a lot of light, um, but it doesn't grow until the winter months because during the summer it competes with phytoplankton um, for nutrients. So there's no competition with phytoplankton in the winter. So it's able to then grow um, in that time using its store carbo carbohydrates. And in May, what we've got is the new growth here, the old growth here, and they create this little collar um, that eventually gets um, uh, eroded off because of wave action. And so this is quite often called the May cast. So 
they lose this, this carbon by a three means. Um, what we were able to say with our work is that the standing stock stock of carbon is much higher in cooler climates. It's primarily because the plants are much bigger, they're much um, wider, and um, quite often they're older as well. Um, and that's because kelp are cold water species. They do better in these cold um, climates with good, good light, um, uh, light penetration as well. So we all, as a function of that, what we find is that actually the amount of carbon that is lost is greater in these cold water environments as well. And we can see that in terms of standing stock here. As you've got an increase in temperature, you've got a reduction in standing stock, so the amount of carbon that's in that environment. You can see that the amount of may cast in terms of biomass is much higher in cold areas, and therefore the amount of detrital production is also much higher. Um, and so, as a function of this, if we look forward into the future, is it likely that actually kelp forests will lose more carbon into the future, uh, lose less carbon, sorry, into the future um, than they do currently? And this feeds into some of the discussion about blue carbon. I think I've already made this point um, in, in that the, the likely the reason for um, the, the differences between these warm water and cool water um, places is that sometimes light is better, but they're cooler temperatures which are, are, are where um, kelp does better. So this is some work that was done um, by um, one of um, Dan's, well, I guess he was an MRS student when he was doing this. Um, and what we can see here, this is um, some comparison of the sort of amount of carbon produced um, by kelp um, in Europe compared to other um, vegetative habitats. So what we've got here is carbon stock. In the, the dark blue, we've got what is uh, in the soils. So quite obviously, kelp doesn't grow on soils, it grows on rocks. So there's nothing stored in those soils. Um, and what we can see is the blue material is the living material. The take home message from this one is quite clear that kelp doesn't have a huge amount of standing stock compared to other vegetated habitats such as seagrass, salt marsh, um, terrestrial forests. But if we look at the amount of carbon they produce that then is um, exported perhaps to other areas, you can see that the amount of detrital production is somewhat equivalent um, to tidal masses, seagrass, and greater than what occurs in, in um, a terrestrial forests. And it's for this reason that we're starting to hear lots and lots of people talk about the potential of kelp forest as a blue carbon donor habitat. So um, Dan talked about the spatial extent of Laminaria hyperborea, about 18,000 square kilometres. We estimated um, about 11.49 teragrams of carbon is stored in, in this system, um, and the total flux of this is about 1.71 um, uh, teragrams of carbon. And as I said, it's comparable to other um, eco marine uh, vegetated habitats. And this is an image taken um, up in um, it's a site called Warbuck. It was an incredibly low tide. So this is Laminaria hyperborea. This usually wouldn't be exposed um, to the air. And what we can see is it extends over a vast different distance, just to give you an idea of the amount that's there. And of course, there's even more under the sea. And what happens to this material? Dan said that about 80% is, is, is um, lost um, out of the environment. About 20% is directly grazed. So the majority of it moves off to other habitats. Um, quite often it's considered a spatial subsidy, so it might land on sandy beaches, and Dan shows some photos of that, and that might be consumed by birds. I've got, currently got a student looking at the importance of standard kelp um, for bird wind, overwintering birds um, along the Northumberland coastline. We do think that a proportion of it perhaps moves offshore and that some of that is remineralized very quickly. Um, but there is the potential that some of it could be stored, um, buried in sediment and stored um, in, in, in the environment and it could be sequestered away. And hence why people talk about kelp as a potential blue carbon um, species. So there's emerging evidence from stable isotopes, eDNA, and other techniques um, that, that kelp may, may be stored in these um, in environments. And I guess the question that we um, are asking now is, how important is, is the carbon from the kelp in terms of a blue carbon habitat? And I guess we've been wanting to look at this for a, a good many years, and lots of people just actually pre-pooed us, the biogeochemists thought it was insignificant. 
Um, but now, I think Kane talked about this, is that we're sort of, as, as a scientific community, we're at the crawling um, before walking, before running stage, and actually there's a bit of hype going on at the moment that, we're, that, that a lot of the scientific community probably think that we're running before we're walking. And so, we quite often see quoted that about 50% of carbon um, is sequestered in long-term sinks. But this is based on a, on a paper by um, Dorothy Krauss Jensen and Carlos Duarte that was just based on four studies. This, was, this paper was written, it's written, um, got a lot of um, attention, but it was sort of very much written as a line in the sand and, and saying that we need to go and actually understand a lot more about the dynamics here. The amount of carbon that is sequestered is likely to be very context dependent. We know that different species produce different levels of, of um, detritus. We know different kelp species detritus breaks down and is remineralized re faster than others. It's likely to be dependent on, on ocean current. It's likely to be dependent on proximity to sink. So if you're closer to the continental shelf, it's perhaps more likely that that carbon reaches the deep sea and is stored away. We also know that some seaweed um, kelp forest habitats themselves are likely to be actually net emitters of CO2 um, because of respiration by microbes, plants, and animals. Personally, I think that we should be protecting our kelp forest because even if a fraction of that detritus enters the marine environment is, and, and, and is sequestered away, it is beneficial not only to kelp forests that are huge reservoirs of diversity, but also it has benefits in terms of mitigating climate change. I guess my concern at the moment is that we still don't know enough about this and we still need to do an awful lot of work to understand this. And what I don't want is the sort of greenwashing where we're starting to talk about um, kelp as a blue carbon donor and, and, and using it as a, a reason, the blue carbon aspect for a reason to actually restore kelp for us. We want to restore kelp forests because they support a wide range of diversity. They support fisheries and things like that. I'm sure they do have a role in, in natural carbon sequestration, but let's not run before we can walk. Oh, and there's a summary. <laughs> uh, so kelp forests are widespread globally and around the uh, UK. They support really high levels of diversity. They're important in terms of the flow of carbon mainly in terms of trophic um, importance, but also potentially as a carbon sink. But we've still got a lot, lot more to learn. And there um, is another of Dan's jokes.